Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present part nine of my series on the selected gross pathology of the skin. We're going to talk about a variety of nutritional, metabolic, and toxic diseases which affect the skin of domestic species. Before I begin, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who provided me these fantastic images over the years, which allow me to put these lectures together. Let's start with some nutritional diseases. Usually deficiencies of various vitamins and minerals that are important for skin metabolism. Can we talk about zinc? We're gonna start with the dog. There are several types of zinc deficiencies which affect dogs. The first is seen in Malamutes and Huskies, which have an inherited defect in absorbing zinc, which usually manifests in times of stress, such as pregnancy or concurrent disease. It's a mild form of hyperkeratosis, which usually shows up on the face or around mucocutaneous junction, pressure points, and foot pads. I'm just putting a foot pad out here, which is crusty and hyperkeratotic and can be seen in any of these diseases in the dog or other diseases. And if you told me you thought this was a case of hard pad disease due to canine distemper, I don't think I could argue with you on that. Okay, a second form of zinc deficiency, which is seen in dogs, is known as generic dog food dermatosis, seen in rapidly growing pups on either a low zinc or high calcium diet. Calcium, you know, because it has the same covalence number, will compete with zinc. You can also see this on animals with a lot of soy or cereal in their diets due to the concentrates of phytic acid which will bind the zinc in the gut and interferes with zinc absorption. Generic dog food dermatosis usually starts on the pressure areas as do a lot of these zinc uh, conditions. This condition and the condition that I mentioned before, the genetic problem with Malamutes and Huskies usually are responsive to zinc administration. Now, there's a third problem that is seen particularly in bull terriers, which is an autosomal recessive defect in zinc metabolism, which does not respond to zinc and invariably is lethal in these animals. The, the condition is known as lethal acrodermatitis. They don't respond to as much zinc as you can give them. The condition starts in affected animals at six to 10 weeks of age. And beyond just the skin problems, the severe hyperkeratosis and exfoliative dermatitis, you see a severe T cell deficiency. So the animals ultimately die of bronchopneumonia or other secondary infectious. In these animals, copper is low also. So this is lethal acrodermatitis in bull terriers. And finally, I'm going to mention a disease in which the specific uh, deficiency has not been identified, but also gives you the lesion of crusting, especially on the foot pads. And it's a condition known as hepatocutaneous syndrome, uh, it was originally called superficial necrolytic dermatitis, which is a terrible name for it. Hepatocutaneous syndrome is a better one. This is a condition that is seen in chronic liver disease, such as cirrhosis. It's also been associated with various types of pancreatic tumors, including glucagonomas and diabetes. You can see it in the cat, but you generally don't see foot pad lesions. And the basic mechanism behind a liver disease and skin concurrent skin disease is a deranged metabolism of amino acids and glucose, and likely in these animals, uh, possible zinc and fatty acid metabolism as well. You can see it on the pads, you can see it on the face, the pinnas of the ear, the distal extremi extremities as well. Here's a severe case on the distal extremity. So it's not just a paw pad disease, but most of the pictures out there are of the paw pads. Well, I don't like to put a lot of histo in my lectures. I actually find histo a little bit on the boring side. This is such a great lesion in hepatocutaneous syndrome. It is referred to as the red, white, and blue sign. Okay, and this is the epidermis. The red part 
is the perichoritosis. It's this dense lamella of uh, the stratum corneum, which still has nuclei in it. When you get to this point, the, new, the cell should be totally dead. Um, there shouldn't be any nuclei. This perikeratotic hyperkeratosis, the normal basket weave uh, hyperkeratosis that you see um, without nuclei is orthokeratotic hyperkeratosis. That's basically normal in the dog. Okay, underneath that, we have this whitish area. It's cells of the keratohyaline layer, the stratum spongiosum, um, as well, and there is extensive edema. These cells are swollen and their cytoplasm is whitish. And then finally, we have hyperplasia, hyperplasia of the basal cell layers, which gives us this blue appearance. So red, white, and blue associated with hepatocutaneous syndrome. Now, dogs aren't the only species that are associated with zinc disease. Um, there is a disease in pigs, which starts from the back forward, often seen over the back legs, pressure points, and the hocks, and moves its way forward, um, which is zinc responsive as well. In pigs, it's called perikeratosis. It's usually seen in pigs that are, are young, between two to four months of age, um, there are pigs that aren't supplemented with zinc or don't have access to soil, which is most of your commercially produced pigs these days. It's a relative imbalance of zinc. We've mentioned some of the causes. It's that the diet has too much calcium or too much soybean protein, which binds zinc, or a low concentration of essential fatty acids, which is required for proper absorption of zinc. In addition, certain enteric pathogens or a significant change in the intestinal flora can adversely influence zinc absorption. Here's a front part of the pig, and the initial cutaneous lesions are usually on the lower limbs in the back, particularly over the joints. Eventually, it will begin to cover the face, the scrotum, and the tail. They're papules which are covered by a dry brown crust. And you might actually see some uh, keratosis of the tongue, which appears, appears furry. And the esophageal mucosa becomes sort of a white and dull instead of smooth and glistening. Not all cases of parakeratosis actually have the parakeratosis. Some you have to diagnose uh, based on histologic signs of hypergranulosis and acanthosis and a perivascular dermatitis, which often contains eosinophils, which is not unusual for cutaneous lesions in the pig. Okay, let's move on to a somewhat related compound. And this is copper. We can see copper, especially in uh, sheep and goats, small ruminants, who are uh, deficient in copper in their diet. Uh, interesting, sheep are very sensitive to too much copper and too little copper. They will show clinical signs as well. Usually the first thing that you notice is the animals are unthrifty, they have a decreased weight gain, they may show diarrhea, and then you will notice uh, a change in the hair coat color. Copper is uh, a required cofactor for the oxidation of sulfhydryl groups in keratin. Uh, sulfhydryl groups is copper dependent and it's required for proper keratin cross-linking. So the hair coat will get sort of frayed and coarse looking. Another enzyme that requires copper as a mandatory cofactor is tyrosinase, which as you know is important in pigmentation. So you will see a lightening of the coat, especially around the eyes. These are known as spectacles that affected animals and the coat itself will, or the quality of the wool will be very poor. Another compound which can cause problems in the long term when they take, the animals take in too much, especially animals with hooves, is selenium. This condition, which is 
uh, called alkali disease. Results because certain plants accumulate selenium, and if the animals graze them, then they take in uh, seleno amino acids, okay, or amino acids, which have inserted selenium in place of the corresponding sulfur containing amino acids, which results in problems with hair and hooves. And you can see the rings on the hooves of this horse. Probably there are hoof cracks as well. The hoof, the keratin within the hoof is weak. These animals will often have problems with their hair coat. Um, the long hair of the mane and the tail break off, giving them bobtail and a roached mane appearance. In addition, in addition, reproductive performance may also be impaired, resulting in reduced fertility, which is a problem in ruminants. Uh, poultry can get uh, uh, chronic selenium toxicosis as well, generally resulting in low hatchability of eggs and deformed embryos. Uh, animals with underdeveloped feet and legs, crooked beaks, and malformed eyes. Chronic selenosis. In the older literature, uh, it used to be that chronic selenosis was also blamed for another problem called alkali staggers, but I think that that has been uh, proven now that that is due to high levels of sulfates in the diet and really doesn't have much to do with selenium. Okay, let's look at one more nutritional disease caused by a deficiency of vitamin E, and you can see that there is sort of a ooey gooey hemorrhagic exudate within the subcutis of this chicken. This is known as exudative diastasis. It's one of the manifestations of vitamin E selenium uh, imbalance in poultry, along with a number of other ones, including white muscle disease uh, and encephalomalacia in Turkey. Exudative diastasis is seen in a number of animal species, including pigs, as well it has to do with a vasculitis and an outpouring of fibrin rich uh, high protein edema into the tissues. Exudative diastasis, vitamin E and selenium deficiency. Okay, let's move on to some metabolic diseases that will affect the skin. And the most common metabolic disease affecting the skin, the most common endocrine disease of the dog, and also the most commonly overdiagnosed endocrine disease of the dog is hypothyroidism. It's most commonly seen in middle-aged dogs. You can see this animal shows the characteristic bilateral truncal alopecia and hair loss of a typical endocrinopathy. It's also borderline overweight. Remember your thyroid is sort of like the thermostat of the body and when that slows down um, everything tends to slow down the animals will become somewhat obese. All of the met metabolism slows down a bit. Uh, as we said before, it's most commonly seen in middle-aged dogs. There's no sex predilection, and there's a predisposition in just about men in many, many breeds. When I think about it, I think about Labradors and Golden Retrievers, but you can see it in everything from Sharpays to Great Danes to Boxers, and just about everything in between. On a Skin note, uh, thyroid hormones stimulate antigen and the turnover of follicles. In hypothyroidism, in areas of hair loss, there's an increase in telogen follicles and empty follicles because telogen follicles lose their hair shafts very easily. It's the normal shedding stage of the follicle. These animals often have seborrhea because thyroid hormones influence serum and cutaneous fatty acid concentrations in sebaceous gland function. Um, and then the presence of seborrhea predisposes the animal to secondary bacterial infections or yeast infections like malassezia. There's so much that goes on with these animals. Some hypothyroid dogs develop myxedema or the excessive production of glycosamine and glycans like hyaluronic acid within the skin. This is normally seen in some breeds um, with sort of loose-fitting skin like Sharpays, 
and cocker spaniels, but in hypothyroid animals, the amount of matrix, it's often sort of a bluish matrix, in between fibroblasts and, and adnexa is markedly increased with the dermis. And then finally, uh, thyroid glands have a, uh, a very uh, profound impact on the cutaneous barrier and function of the immune system within the skin. So hypothyroid dogs have impaired function of both B and T cells and are very prone to various secondary infections. So hypothyroidism, the most common, and comes at the skin from a number of directions. Another very common endocrinopathy in the skin of the dog is the one that is associated with Cushing's disease or hypercortisolism, hyperfunction of the adrenal cortex. It has a very classic appearance. Once again, bilaterally truncal alopecia usually begins and is worst over the neck and the back over the shoulders. You see a range of changes in the skin with thinning of the skin uh, and associated increased bruising decreased wound healing, increased infection, and comedone formation, or very dilated follicles with keratin plugs. One of the characteristic changes is associated um, with hyperadrenocorticism in this fantastic picture by Paul Stromberg is calcinosis cutis, and the exact cause is not seen but uh, possible mechanism is that the high levels of circulating cortisol causes a change in the tertiary structure of collagen, which predisposes it to calcium deposition. You have mineralization of the skin. It starts out at a, as a very uh, fine basophilic stippling of the collagen fibers. And when I have a suspicion of hypercortisolism, um, I will take a skin biopsy and put a von Cossus stain on it for mineral, which is going to pick up the mineral that you really can't pick up. It's usually very diffuse and that helps you miss it. Um, so a nice mineral stain, something like this, you're not going to have any trouble picking it up. You're going to have large lakes of crystalline mineral and it gets to the point where it might actually get to osteoma cutis, where you have bone formation with marrow in severe cases, but it's sort of a spectrum and you don't want to miss the mild cases. So this is calcinosis, uh, calcinosis cutis. Don't confuse it as I almost just did with calcinosis circumscripta, which we've already looked at. It's a, that is a focal dystrophic calcification, which affects young dogs primarily over pressure points and the tongue. This is older dogs with concurrent hypercortisolemia, and usually this is what is seen in the back. There are a lot of, of diseases of the skin which have been associated with endocrinopathy over the years and one of the worst names for a, uh, a disease is alopecia X and it's growing in popularity because a lot of the uh, various sex steroid and growth hormone related diseases are now sort of linked in and lumped into alopecia X because they have similar gross and histologic findings. Um, alopecia X now incorporates uh, growth hormone responsive dermatosis and castration responsive dermatosis and hyposomatotropism and estrogen responsive dermatosis. Uh, usually these are uh, small breed animals um, I tend to think of like Kesons and Pomeranians and small sort of fluffyish dogs. And it is a, all of these diseases have the same uh, dysregulation of adrenal hormone synthesis, which results in too much progesterone, estrogen, or, or too much androgen. And so it's all a complex interplay of uh, various hormones, especially the sex hormones, which results in severe trichalemal keratinization, the presence of flame follicles. So the histologic lesions are same, the causes may be very different. Uh, in some cases, 
a partial deficiency of 21 hydroxylase has been identified, which is necessary for adrenal steroid production. So a complex interplay, uh, which essentially results in this sort of spreading flank alopecia and hyperpigmentation in small fluffy type dogs. Another condition um, which has, there's a number of theories as to what causes it. It very well may have been better put into the immune mediated lecture is vitiligo. Vitiligo, which is seen in many animal species, including people, is an acquired melanocytopenic hypomelanosis, um, characterized by these well delineated areas of loss of pigment. Um, or leukoderma and leukotrichia. Leukoderma is where the skin loses pigment. Leukotrichia is where the hair loses pe pigment. It's often bilaterally symmetric and involves the face, especially the platum nasale, the lips, the buccal mucosa, and may affect the distal extremities and the paw pads. It can occur any at any age in the animal, and usually the full extent is a rapidly uh, progressing thing, and the full extent is probably seen three to six months after its start. Here we see it in a horse, and there's a number of theories um, as to how vitiligo takes place. Um, some people believe it's an autoimmune destruction of melanocytes. Some believe that there is a release of a neurochemical from peripheral nerves in the area that inhibit melanogenesis. And some um, have this self-destructive theory that melanin precursors themselves are toxic to melanocytes, or there simply may be uh, a gradual loss of a protective factor which protects the melanocytes from the products that they're making. It's also been described in cats and cattle, in addition to dogs and horses and people. Well, this skin just tore. We can see some hemorrhage here. The skin on this cat is very thin. This one, okay, we can get by, but this one, not a good one. A great picture by Sam Jennings of a condition which is known as feline skin fragility syndrome. And feline skin fragility syndrome um, has been associated with a number of conditions. We talked in the first lecture about Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and cutaneous asthenia. This is not that. This is acquired. The other ones are genetic defects. Um, it enzymes which uh, are important in collagen formation and packing like procollagen and peptidase. Um, this is an acquired disease which is usually seen and associated with hypercortisolism in cats but has also been identified in a number of cases of FIP. Here's a cool little thing. doesn't really cause a whole lot of problems but it might be a hallmark of other problems to come and this is a cat whose tips of the ears have fallen over or folded over due to excessive corticosteroid administration or production. Normally I'd say there's a market for these cats as Americans like to buy all sorts of deformed animals, um, but there is already is a cat whose ears do this normally, the Scottish fold, so probably a better idea just to uh, check this animal out and find out where it's getting into too many steroids. Here is a weepy sore, actually there are multiple weepy sores on the skin of the dog. This is paniculitis, and there are a number of causes of paniculitis. It might be sterile autoimmune paniculitis. It may be the result of trauma. There is a particular uh, type that affects the back of the, the skin of dogs. Um, it's in Dr. Gross's book, which she refers to as doggy door dermatitis. The animals, as they go through the, the door, it hits them in the back of the same place each time. It eventually causes enough trauma that you get a inflammatory lesion there. Don't forget, animals with multiple 
areas of paniculitis, you want to check the pancreas very closely. Probably has to do with the liberation of lipase into the circulation. The animal's sort of plump. It is going to go and do some damage to the fat underneath the skin as well as in other areas of the body, but at least we can see the skin. So paniculitis, don't forget about the pancreas. Just a couple of other lesions before we get out of the metabolic lesions. This is a guinea pig with severe alopecia. Guinea pigs are well known for going into telogen effluvium. This is another picture from Dean Percy. Um, as a result of systemic stress, especially pregnancy. Pregnancy is very hard on guinea pigs. They give rise to very large, precocious pups, and uh, uh, they will basically shut down non-essential systems so they can provide nourishment to this large one or two growing pups. And one of the things that they often will shut down is production of new hairy. That's a nice to have, not a need to have, during times of stress. So it's a, likely the result of reduced anabolism of uh, maternal skin during fetal growth. Um, other things to think about would be something like cystic retovarii. A lot of people uh, will blame just about everything on cystic reeds in guinea pigs because they almost always have them when you look. And so uh, they're always good to blame things on. The problem is just due to stress and reduced uh, hair growth because the, the guinea pig doesn't need it right now. It's funneling all of its nutrients into the developing pups. And then finally, one of my favorite uh, metabolic diseases, uh, hormonal disease in ferrets known as adrenal-associated endocrinopathy. Um, I think there is a market for these animals, but it takes five or six years to grow them up. Uh, this is a fairly common issue in American bloodlines of ferrets that are neutered at an early age. And when they are neutered, ferrets, like many mustelids, have a very profound uh, hypothalamus pituitary uh, gonad feedback loop. And they are seasonal breeders, so at the beginning of every year when the days start to get longer, um, the hypothalamus will wake up, it will stimulate the pituitary to secrete a luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Well, when we remove the ovaries and the testes, the, the luteinizing hormone sort of gets them ready to breed, but if we have the testes and the ovaries removed, there's no feedback, so the pituitary continues to say, wake up gonads, wake up gonads, and secretes more and more luteinizing hormone. And eventually, after months, if not years, of this pounding by a luteinizing hormone, the cells of the zona reticularis and the zona fasciculata in the adrenal gland have the ability, uh, in such cases, to produce sex steroids in place of the gonads. The ones that are generally produced are estrogen, 17-hydroxyprogesterone, and androstenedione, a form of uh, testosterone. And estrogen has a profound effect on the hair follicles um, and causes them to go into telogen, and the hair shafts will fall out. So this is a unique thing to ferrets, certain strains of mice, and people, the production of sex steroids from the adrenal gland instead of the gonads, known as adrenal-associated endocrinopathy. Okay, let's finish up this lecture with a couple of toxins um, that will affect the skin that we need to know about. Okay, we're looking at the feet of a calf and you can see that the there is uh, gangrene of the foot, all of the tissue below the pastern is dead, it is broken loose, and in severe cases you can see actual, the subcutis is black and dead, and the bone is dead, and um, they will, these animals will either walk out of their claws, they could fracture their feet. One of the things that I suppose you could think about would be frostbite. But cattle are pretty hardy animals, and, and it does happen. Um, it happens more often to the tips of the ears and the tail, but it can happen in very cold areas 
I suppose, but things that you want to think about are plant toxins, um, such as ergot al alkaloids, um, which is produced by the uh, uh, fescue fungus Neotyphodium cenophalium. The condition is called fescue foot, and it produces ergot, ergonavine or ergotamine, which causes vasoconstriction in the uh, extremities. Um, ergot used to be administered to people for headaches because it's a vasoconstrictor. It used to be administered to women following childbirth um, who have bleeding tendencies to stop bleeding. It's not used, but, but some synthetic forms now are used. But in cattle who are grazing um, a number of uh, plants. Fescue has Neotyphodium cenophalium. Uh, Claviceps purpurea is a common uh, contaminant of certain types of cereal grains, such as rye, and that also produces an ergot alkaloid. So we have tremendous vasoconstriction to the point of the extremities, the tips of the, the ears, the tail will fall off. This in less uh, severe cases, um, you may simply see a lowered fertility in animals that are grazing this type of, uh, uh, of plant parasite. It also will cause other reproductive problems because ergovaline is an agonist for, for dopamine receptors. So you'll also see an inhibition of prolactin secretion so the animals won't lactate or you'll develop agalactia in horses or swine. And it also causes uh, imbalances in progesterone or estrogen so the animals will not come into season or may be associated with early parturition. Animals that are also taking in small amounts of ergot will develop something called epidemic hyperthermia or summer syndrome, a, a flock or a herd-wide problem um, in which the animals um, are hyperthermic in hot weather and they develop hypersaliva hypersalivation and hyperthermia. To diverge for just a minute, um, people uh, will get ergotism, or at least used to in the past. Um, it used to be called St. Anthony's fire and people would use contaminated ryegrass to make bread and they would get this ergot and their their legs and their feet were uh, would just burn it would it, it would be extremely painful and it was the monks of St. Anthony who developed a way to treat this by uh, giving the, the people, affected people, some circulation stimulating plant extracts and tranquilizers. So they were the first ones to treat uh, human victims of ergotism. Another manifestation of toxicity in the skin is photosensitization. Most commonly seen in ruminants and it comes in basically three subtypes. The first one is the result of ingestion of certain preformed photodynamic toxins. And, and the basis between all of these is the presence in the bloodstream of photodynamic compounds, which are excited in the, the presence of ultraviolet light and actually result in necrosis and burning of the skin. Type one is primary. They are preformed. Uh, including phenothiazine, tetracycline. If you ever say take tetracycline uh, or doxycycline, they tell you stay out of the sun. That's because you can get a bad sunburn in just a short amount of time uh, in the sun. Uh, St. John's wort, which is a common anti natural antidepressant, and buckwheat. These are all um, preformed toxins that don't have to be broken down by the liver and can result in photosensitization. Uh, type 2 photosensitization is generally a congenital enzyme deficiency in animals that do not have proper levels of uroporphyrinogen 3 cosynthetase. Okay, this results in uh, abnormal heme synthesis and the accumulation of, of various uh, 
malformed heme products, including uroporphyrin, coporphyrin, and protoporphyrin within the blood, which act the same way. They get stimulated by UV when they're in the blood vessels coursing uh, close to the skin. And then type 3 is what's known as hepatid hepatogenous photosensitization. This is the most common form. Most of the uh, most of these agents fall into this. And these are uh, essentially uh, the result of liver disease, cirrhosis, diminished liver function. And the, uh, the uh, animal is unable to excrete phyloerythrin. Phyloerythrin is a breakdown product from chlorophyll, which is, you know, of course, a major part of the diet. And so phyloerythrin is a photodynamic agent uh, which results from the incomplete breakdown of chlorophyll by the liver. So anything that causes liver damage ultimately can cause photosensitization. One of the keys to photosensitization is that it is usually present on the white parts of the animal, the um, animals, parts of the animal that, or the parts that are they're poorly skinned or haired, um, so they have the most highest concentration of ultraviolet light. Here's a great example. The number of pictures out there in this Holstein, and you can see that the dark areas are largely spared, and most of the severe burns and hair loss are on the lightly colored area. There are a number of uh, various compounds that will result in this. This is pollen from Pithomyces chartarum, a, a very common uh, photosensitizing agent. This results in the uh, release of a compound called sporadesmin, which is associated with a condition known as facial eczema. We'll look at in just a moment um, in sheep. Very common cause, and the sporadesmin causes damage to the biliary epithelium, cholestasis, and ultimately liver damage, and results in type 3 or epitogenous photosensitization. There are a lot of compounds like this. If the compounds will damage, significantly damage the hepatocytes or the biliary tree, then photosensitization is one of a number of outcomes in affected animals. And here is the classic condition of facial eczema, once again due to sporidesmin toxicosis from Pithomyces chartarum. It's a mycotoxin of source that attacks the biliary tree, um, resulting in uh, cholangitis, biliary obstruction, liver failure, and ultimately photosensitization. And I have a lot of, you'll see a lot of pictures. It used to be more of a disease of South America, it goes by term Gild, or South Africa, goes by tame, the name Gildacop, but you can see it all over the world, anywhere where there is uh, hepatotoxic plants. You see that how it gets the name facial eczema. This is poorly haired air skin on the back of the ears on a white sheep. You have cracking of the skin, hemorrhage, and tremendous edema. Just more and a tremendous edema that you can see. With uh, There are a number of other compounds that will do this as well as uh, lupines or formopsis, um, and Jubin Kennedy has a long list of various diseases that can cause this problem, although the classic is sporodesmin toxicity. Oh, just want to mention here's a very yellow. We talked about copper deficiency in sheep. Here is copper excess. Uh, sheep can't handle copper at all if they get too much copper if they're exposed to horse rations or rations of other species which have a lot more copper in them you can end up with this chronic cycling of hemolysis um, and acute tubular nephrosis ultimately resulting in death in about 12 to 24 hours 
um, because of the severe intravascular hemolysis caused by the periodic waves of hepatocellular necrosis and release of copper into the uh, extracellular milieu, you get tremendous icterus. So the point here is that the skin will be yellow, the mucous membranes will be yellow. When you're talking about sheep, you have got to consider possibility of copper. There are a couple of intracellular parasites like pyroplasms, which go way down the list. Uh, Babesia ovis, maybe Clostridium hemolyticum, um, but you got to think about any yellow sheep. Copper is the top three things on your list. It's not the only toxin to the skin. This is uh, arsenic, and arsenic used to be used in sheep dip, of all things, and uh, it leads to a a necrotizing to a suppurative deep dermatitis in sheep. Yeah, it's crazy. You just dip your sheep in poison to uh, kill the parasites, especially after shearing. So you see deep dermatitis, the skin would sort of slough off as we see here on the scrotum. It causes a hyperkeratosis in people, very different lesion seen in some parts of Asia, including Bangladesh and China. Um, usually it has to do with contaminated drinking water. Groundwater usually becomes contaminated with runoff from uh, mines or various parts of agriculture. And uh, very similar to what we see uh, with selenium, uh, arsenic has a very high affinity for sulfhydryl groups and you know, affects the keratin balance in the body. And then one more uh, toxin of the skin, which we don't see much anymore. Um, this is a condition which is known as xanthomatosis in chickens. And it is not really a neoplasm, although it looks like it. it's really xanthogranulomous inflammation, which means that it is an inflammation in which the macrophages have large amounts of fat in them, just tremendous fatty uh, breakdown with cholesterol clefts and there is a special type of giant cell that is seen in xanthogranulomous inflammation called a Teuton's giant cell and it has a ring of nuclei which sort of make it look like a donut outside of the ring between the outside of the ring and the cell wall is usually a lot of fat vacuoles and on the inside it's sort of clear so very characteristic and you see it in xanthomas um, and nobody really knows. We don't see this as sort of a historical disease, and it was attributed to high levels of chlorinated hydrocarbons in the diet. There are two types of skin diseases in chickens. There are the ones that cause disease, or, or when you look at the skin, you have the follicles, you have the interfollicular areas. Those that cause bulging in the, in the follicles generally are tumors. Those that cause a swelling of the interfollicular skin. When you look at the skin, all of these little bumps are what used to be the follicles um, because of the inflammation, the feathers have fallen out. But uh, So this is xanthomatosis. You can also see it here in the wattle. Xanthomatosis of chickens, historical disease. Um, I always like this picture. It looks like uh, this chicken's going for a vacation and taking his luggage with him. Um, and that basically covers some of the interesting, certainly not all of the nutritional, metabolic, and toxic lesions, but we brought it in under 45 minutes. And in our next lecture, we're going to, one of my favorite lectures in every system is the miscellaneous lectures, which are just weird diseases, which don't have a unifying theme, and they always have a good story. So look for that next time. Um, with that, I wish everybody a wonderful day, wonderful health, and I will see you all next time.